This lesson is on Japan's imperial age, and this is part four of a six-part series on East Asia in the post-classical period. Now before we start looking at Japan, I want to return to this theory of the core and periphery states. Um, you've seen this screen before, and there are these comparisons between Byzantium and Islam in China as the core states, and then places like Eastern Europe, West Africa, and in this series, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam as the periphery states. Now remember, core states are more sophisticated in terms of STEM capabilities. They're bigger, they're older, and they're more connected to the world network. Often these were the civilizations that rose first, right? The Middle East, uh, Egypt, and China, and the exception here is Byzantium, but and they are the so-called haves, they're the people who have stuff. And, you know, they focus on things that require a lot of education and a lot of technology in order to accomplish. And then the periphery states, and remember periphery means around the outside or around the edges. The periphery states are smaller, they have less STEM capabilities, they're often brought into the world network by core states and highly influenced by the core states. And you see they're more focused, especially here, on natural resource extraction. And so, you know, the the natural resources come out of the periphery states and then the core states send them things that require manufacturing, knowledge, you know, uh, sophistication. And it tends to make the core states wealthier and the poor states or the periphery states poorer. Um, and so it just becomes this vicious cycle. Now, beginning our study of Japan here and, and their earliest uh, influence under Chinese leadership, we're going to go back to 646 CE and the so-called Taika reforms. And in the Taika reforms, the emperor of Japan redesigned the whole government to look like China's, right? He saw the Chinese government as the model for him to follow. And so he starts forcing his administrators to learn Chinese. He starts trying to get his aristocrats to act Chinese in terms of their dress, the way they spoke, um, you know, they learn to write in Chinese, which, you know, is not applicable to the Japanese language. Um, you know, and he imports Confucianism and Buddhism into, you know, the state and tries to make them the state religions. And, you know, this worked for a time, but, you know, there's a backlash against both the Buddhists and the Taika reforms, um, you know, because Buddhism became a state religion, the Buddhist monks became very powerful and influential to the point where there was a, even a, a very powerful Buddhist monk who had hatched a plot to have the emperor assassinated so that he could take over and, like, marry the empress. I mean, it was just this high drama thing, but it shows you, you know, how ambitious these Buddhist monks were becoming. And it got so bad that, you know, in 794 CE, the Emperor Kamu moved the capital to Heian, which is modern day Kyoto. And he did this in order to for, for, forbid the building of monasteries in the city, you know, as an attempt to try to stop the Taika reforms and return to Japan's older feudal military organization where the aristocrats and the warlords controlled things as opposed to the emperor and the bureaucrats and the Buddhists. It's kind of an interesting change here, right? Because usually we think of Buddhists as being very separate. I mean, that's what we see in places like Vietnam and India, that the Buddhists are kind of off on their own, minding their own business. But, you know, in Japan, the Buddhists became, you know, political movers and shakers, kind of similar to the way that priests and bishops operated within European politics, especially in the Western lands that were dominated by the Catholic Church. And the Heian period also became a very courtly um, period. You know, and the word courtly here, you know, when we think of, I'm going to get that out of the way. When we think about courtly, you know, it's kind of, you know, fancy, uh, you know, high class. You know, in the Heian period, Japan became very wealthy, and these aristocrats were, you know, very sophisticated, and they had this emphasis on manners and ritual and very formal, stiff behaviors. Um, you know, as a Westerner and as an American, I think, you know, I kind of associate that with traditional Japanese culture, and, and that's an offshoot from the Heian period. Um, also an emphasis on elaborate gardens and palaces, and really, I mean, e even though the Han emperors were trying to distance themselves from China, they kind of fell into this Chinese way of, you know, focusing on the upper 
upper classes and just ignoring the people, very similar to what we see in the downfall of both the Han and Tang dynasties um, as the emperors retreat into their pleasure palaces. And this didn't work so well. You know, because the emperors and the courtesans were all obsessed with beauty and just sort of living this highly refined life, the aristocrats started dismantling the bureaucracy and regaining power. And as the power shifts towards the great warlords and great families in the countryside, you know, we kind of get this pattern that we see, you know, and again, they're, they're trying to distance themselves from China, but this is a very Chinese pattern that the power shifts away from you know, the emperor and towards the warlords. And, you know, this is a typical feudal breakdown and leads to power vacuums and, you know, in China led to dynastic overturn. Um, Japan's a little bit different in this regard. Um, but so there's this move towards, you know, manorialism. And remember, manorialism is a, is a European term, right? The, the root word here is manor, as in sort of like plantations, that the local uh, landowners, oops, you know, and the land, these landowners, they become the real center of power as the imperial government breaks up and loses influence. And so the shift were the, towards the so-called bushi, right? These local warlords who develop these isolated plantations, kind of like ultra-small city-states or manors. And you can refer back to the lesson on Western Europe. It has you know some images of what manors look like, um, you know. And in the the bushi system, the peasant class starts to become more like serfs. They're under the control of their bushi or their master. Um, and these bushi start to build independent armies that are separate from you know the imperial army it's kind of ultra localized you know low level feudalism here and this is where the samurai class comes out of the samurai were the most sophisticated um, warriors or the the heroes of any bushi's army are these samurais they're kind of the the top warriors you know it became so kind of fragmented and isolated that these buddhist monasteries were also developing their own private armies or hiring local thugs to come defend them and be their private police forces and so you can see this kind of fragmentation this isolation and crime and so it's no surprise that violence you know was on the rise in japan because the central government was so weak you know, and, and so the samurai class it might help you to think about the European knights that we've looked at, right? They owe their allegiance to a local warlord or bushi, and they develop, you know, devoted time to really perfecting military skill and manners. I mean, these were ultra elite, ultra high level warriors. And as you know from our very earliest studies of world history, it takes a lot of food and energy and technology to support these guys as they just focus on all day long on becoming great fighters. And, you know, similar to European knightly warfare at the time period, you know, it's this heroic model where the top samurai between each bushi goes out and fights and not always to the death, but, you know, the winner, it's like the whole army wins because the champion won. And it's the armies kind of stand back and watch and cheer and it's like, you know, the top guy against the top. It's really almost like in a basketball game where, you know, uh, right now, the the Spurs and the Heat are in the championship. Uh, it would be like you know the other four guys for each team just kind of stand there and cheer while I don't know uh, LeBron James and Tim Duncan go against each other one on one while the other four guys just stand back and watch. This is a real strange model of warfare if you're used to modern warfare that involves hundreds and thousands of soldiers. And like I said, sometimes these. Uh, heroes weren't defeated in battle and when they lost this was that ritual that we call seppuku or sometimes known as harikari but seppuku is the proper term this ritual suicide for honor we see this picture here of what that would have looked like you know this samurai who's been defeated you know he's going to go ahead and take his short knife and open up his guts and die because he's been dishonored i mean this is absolutely the sort of death before dishonor type of or death after dishonor honor type of model you know and out of this kind of bushy system and this manorialism you know we get these warring families or these you know kind of high level clans like the Taira and the Fujiwara and the Minamoto families and they fought for 
kind of control of the emperorship. At this point, the emperor is just kind of a puppet. He's a pawn. He's used by these great families, and they're fighting to get their candidate in as the emperor. And, and like I said, I mean, it's really the families that control things. Also, you know, this kind of fragmentation and lawlessness. China's influence uh, over Japan goes down um, way low. You know, you've got these shoguns who are the true leaders of the government. They're the military leaders who kind of sit next to the emperor and very often tell him what to do. And Japan is going backwards at this point. I mean, they're headed towards barbarism. And it's, you know, it's a very violent time period in which they're not advancing in terms of STEM and technology and agriculture and trade and markets. They're just, you know, fighting and fighting and fighting. Um, but so once the, you know, kind of things stabilize, I mean, it's violent and fragmented, but the system is stable and everybody understands what it is. You know, we start to get inside these castles, you know, manufacturing and specialization of labor. And we start to get some limited merchants. And then over time, a merchant class begins to move goods between these warlords holdings in these castles. And also there starts to be a little bit of redevelopment of trade with China. Um, also Zen Buddhism uh, develops and Zen Buddhism is very much about simplicity and discipline this appeal to the warrior class I mean I think part of this was an offshoot of the political Buddhism a lot of Buddhists in Japan became sick of the very political Buddhists who were out there trying to pull the government around and they just you know the Zen really focuses on the self and simplicity and discipline you know, and, and, you know, these castles were very beautiful places where, you know, things like the classical tea ceremonies come out of. And so we start to see a kind of stabilization and reorganization of Japan along these feudal lines. Right. And, and so in our next series, when we get to period four of world history, we'll look at how Japan re-centralizes into a more cohesive state again. Um, but, you know, as I've talked about throughout this lesson, a lot of similarities here between feudal Western Europe at the end of the Dark Ages in the medieval period and Japan. Um, you know, it's kind of funny, right, because both Western Europe in the post-classical period and Japan in the post-classical period, they're very brutal and violent periods. But in our day and age, we kind of romanticize, like, you know, a lot of people think samurais are really cool. and But these people lived a whole you know, horridly bloody and violent lives. And uh, it was a really tough time, you know, but out of that, they kind of set these cultural patterns that still influence both civilizations. So, you know, often when we're talking about classical European or classical Japanese, we're really talking about period three of world history, as opposed to when we talk about classical India or classical China or classical Rome, we're talking about period two of world history. So like we've seen with the Western hemisphere, periodization is not the same at all times and all places um, because really classical is a kind of model that the later civilization follows and this was absolutely the classical period for both Europe and Japan so interesting connections there all right thanks for watching